Well, good morning, everybody. And I, is this on? Yep, it's on. Okay. And I just want to welcome you to our uh, fisheries and aquaculture session today. It's entitled Enhancing the Resilience of the North Carolina Seafood Industry. And we've got five speakers today. They're going to be talking about the work that Cooperative Extension and Sea Grant are doing together to be able to strengthen and also to expand this industry because it's very important to consumers, as we will uh, explain to you here shortly. We have four different sources of uh, seafood in this state that people can access. Commercial fishing or the wild caught industry is, is probably the largest, followed by marine aquaculture, specifically oysters, uh, soft crabs and clams. Uh, recreational fishing, that sector is extremely large and extremely profitable. And we also have subsistence fishing, which are uh, people who fish basically for friends and family, and we don't really have a good handle on the economic impact there. But basically commercial fishing, marine aquaculture, and recreational fishing comprises the majority of the, uh, the ways people in this state source seafood. There are a number of factors that affect the availability of wild caught as well as aquacultured seafood and weather certainly affects both. Uh, if boats can't get out on the ocean waters because of rough seas, they're not gonna be able to harvest any fin fish. And weather is also an important factor in, uh, in the amount of rains that we get that uh, cause pollution runoff into uh, shellfish beds. So when that happens, our shellfish beds shut down and there are restrictions on, on the ability to harvest shellfish for markets. Harvest regulations basically affect the, uh, the wild caught industry more than anything else. Climate change is certainly going to affect both the cultured industry as well as the wild caught industry. Um, also, a uh, declining number of fishers and a corresponding decline in the number of fish houses that are processing wild caught product will affect that particular sector. And production yields and production methods will certainly affect the availability of product that we can culture. Fragment, fragmented supply chains that are going from the coast to inland metropolitan markets of the state affect uh, both sectors of that seafood industry, so we have work to do there. Back in uh, March of 2020, just before the pandemic got started, Sea Grant and Cooperative Extension uh, issued a online survey across the state <clears throat> to seafood consumers to learn basically what the um, demand for North Carolina seafood was. <clears throat> and what we did in this particular survey is that we developed a choice experiment. And what we did is, is that we gave consumers 25 different buying scenarios where we gave them two different types of shrimp or two different types of flounder. And the only difference between them was the origin where they were harvested. Did they bear a sustainability label or did they bear a wild caught label? And we varied the price anywhere between seven and $19 a pound. And the program that we used mixed and matched these different attributes in order to figure out basically what it was that consumers said that they, um, we wanted to know basically from this experiment how much I would say encouragement these types of uh, labels would give us. And what we learned from this is, is that North Carolina labeled product does increase purchase intent among consumers. If you say that the product was harvested in North Carolina, then people are much more likely to want to purchase that. And that's good news for our industry because that gives them the opportunity to do some premium pricing. We also learned that the reason people were buying seafood, specifically North Carolina product, because they think that it has a flavorful taste, less than half were buying it for the health benefits, which doesn't correlate well with the national literature that says it's the reverse. And we also know that people are buying North Carolina seafood because the most important factor is, is they believe it is safer than product from other states and certainly from overseas. We also asked them to, to rate um, their most popular seafood, uh, what they liked to purchase when they were in, in markets and not surprisingly shrimp, what came in as number one because that is America's number one most popular seafood followed by flounder, scallops, catfish and oysters. So all of those are represented uh, uh, among fishermen who harvest these particular products. And so that's good news too, but we got to keep in mind as well is that consumers do have choices and preferences for the center of the plate proteins that they purchase. So the last most available data that we have right now for per capita consumption is 2018. And as you can see from the pie chart up there, 
is that there's much more consumption of chicken, beef, and pork in relation to seafood. And part of that is, is availability uh, because those are domesticated products and also price and also its availability anywhere in the markets. So we really do have to work with our industry more on marketing and technology in order to raise awareness of that seafood and on distribution to be able to get it to the people who want it most, who value uh, purchasing local seafood. So before the pandemic kicked in, before we had uh, shutdowns uh, of the uh, food service sector, we asked people where they were buying their seafood. And what we learned is, is that the majority of people were getting their seafood from grocery stores or uh, at restaurants. Uh, very little were buying at retail outlets that serve primarily seafood or at farmers markets. Now, when the pandemic finally caused shutdowns to occur, there was a huge pivot to direct marketing because people were panicking, they were frantic, they weren't able to sell to restaurants anymore, but they needed to stay in business and how are they gonna reach customers? So up in the Chesapeake area, oyster growers began a tied to table initiative where they actually delivered oysters and recipes to the customers who wanted it. And out in California and Wisconsin, there were uh, farmers that started multi-farm CSAs in order to draw people uh, to those markets for those who didn't want to go into grocery stores. Here in our state, the North Carolina Local Food Council launched its remote internships to support enterprises program to link interns with um, businesses who wanted to get into e-commerce. And the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services greatly expanded its Visit North Carolina Farms app program which is mobile technology for phones and tablets to help consumers locate producers who are selling local food anywhere in the state. So we have a strategic plan at Sea Grant. It's on our website. And for fisheries and aquaculture, we have four broad goals. First one being is to advance and sustain uh, marine resources and dependent ecosystems. The second is, is to help seafood businesses uh, adopt strategies that will help, be, help them become more competitive in the marketplace. Uh, we also want to encourage recreational anglers to better understand and appreciate aquatic resources, and we want consumers to be better educated about the value of eating wild-caught and cultured seafood. We really want them to know how important these sectors are to the state's economy. And under each of those goals, we have specific outcomes. And so what we would like to do today is present to you on goal one is research and testing that's being done uh, to reduce commercial bycatch and fishing mortality. And Sarah Mirabilio will talk on that. We also wanna to talk to you about some of the work we're doing uh, to uh, use technology and marketing approaches to help businesses better navigate uh, the marketplace, especially when there are rapid market, uh, or rapid market disruptions like we had two years ago. Uh, we also want to talk about uh, the uh, opportunities for stewardship that recreational hang anglers have. Uh, in the uh, commercial market, and Scott will talk about that. And then Eric Edwards uh, will talk about the economic impacts that the North Carolina wildcat industry uh, has on the state's economy and the jobs that it supports. So with that overview, what I'd like to do right now is turn it over to Eric Edwards. He is the Assistant Professor and Extensive Specialist at the Department of Ag and uh, Economic Resources at NC State University. All right, great. Um, let's see. So, fifteen minutes. 15 minutes. We'll, we'll see how that goes. It's this this year's. All right. So yeah. So uh, Barry put up some some kind of general numbers right on his first slide, and it, it made me uh, cringe a little bit. So we'll, we'll talk about those. I'm going to talk about economic uh, impact analysis uh, and as it relates to the commercial fishing industry. The study we did was on the wild caught industry, but we actually made a small mistake and included uh, mariculture uh, in there as well, which is which was easy to do based on the, our, our understanding at the time. Um, so I'll break that out for you. So it's it's a small it's a small part of the overall number, but uh, I've just changed it to commercial fishing industry. I'm not sure if the, how much other aquaculture there is, but uh, certainly all the oysters uh, are in this are in these numbers as well. Um, so, well, let's see. There we go. All right. So, 
the general idea of an economic impact analysis is to understand how important a change in an activity, an economic activity, is to some local region, right? So you can think about the classic example and the classic example of misuse of economic impact analysis is sports stadiums, right? You have a sports owner who comes into a, a location. There's one big one going on in Nashville right now and says, if you build me this $600 million stadium, it's going to generate, you know, a billion dollars a year in economic impact in the region. And that's ju public justification for, for building a stadium or something like that. And the idea is, here's the economic impact. We're going to do something in a region. Then we're going to look at not just how much sales that stadium does, but the jobs it creates, how they're going to spend their income, all the supply chains, all the, the things that the, the stadium is going to use, et cetera. Um, so we're going to try to do something like that uh, for the fishing sector in North Carolina. And what I find interesting about it is sort of breaking down in comparisons, not the overall number. I know everyone loves the, the overall big numbers, but breaking it down, we can see uh, what's important, what's changing, uh, what are the differences, especially between the different types of fish, right? So you take you take your, your fish, right? You land them, they, they get landed, they might get sold directly to a grocery store, restaurant, or retail, or they might be processed and then sold. And right, well, this is I'm showing all this stuff happening in state, but of course, at any point in the supply chain, the fish can exit the state, right? So you could land the fish and just ship them right out of state for processing. You could process them and sell them in, in Boston or, or China or anywhere, right? And so in doing economic impact, we want the economic impact on each step of these, this chain of the stuff that's happening in North Carolina. And that's what we're interested in North Carolina. Then we can break it down regionally as well. So we can be interested in a lot of different things. Uh, we can be interested in the relative impact of the different sectors, right? What's the harvesting sector doing versus the processing sector versus the restaurant and retail sector? Um, we can be interested in where things are being landed and what's the impact, you know, what's the impact on the northern part of the coast relative to the southern part of the coast, right? How important is commercial fishing in different parts of the state? Right? We might expect it's less important in Western North Carolina than in Eastern North Carolina, but it also has different importance you know, on, along the coast in a different community. Um, and then we can break it down by fish type, like, like I said. Uh, and I think that those are all really interesting dimensions of interest. The reason I cringe when I see the numbers uh, is economic impact analysis is a lot of things and there's a lot of ways to provide information. So. The, the numbers Barry put up, the first bullet was our numbers from this study, about $300 million uh, for North Carolina seafood, the economic impact. That's a contribution to GDP, right? That's how much that, that uh, number has increased the, 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 the product of North Carolina, right? Then there was that recreational number that was put up that was $4 billion. That's not a contribution to GDP. That's some other measure that's not really comparable to the $300 million, right? So what you get all the time with economic impact analysis is an apples to oranges comparison, right? So it's really important to understand and interpret these things kind of as standalone. We don't want to, we can interpret the $4 billion recreational thing or the $300 million commercial thing. It's not, we don't have the ability to compare that. I'll do some comparisons later on. Um, so that's that's important. Um, and the other important thing to do as, as an economist, I have to throw this out there, EIAs are not economic analysis. No economist does these and says, this is, this is how people should be making decisions on say the allocation of fish or the decisions we make, right? These are big, broad numbers to sort of give you an idea of the magnitude of something, but decisions are made on the margin. Right. So an EIA doesn't tell you, should we harvest, you know, should we set the quota for the fish higher or lower this year because it's impact, it creates this much money and impact. Right. That doesn't tell you the marginal benefit of the fish. So these are really a policy tool for saying, how important is this sector to the state? Um, how important is it that we support the sector in the state? Not 
directly telling you how to make decisions. And again, we'll, we'll get into that uh, momentarily here. Um, so here are the results of our, of our study generally, right? Broken down by sector. Um, and so, right, the overall impact, this is the contribution to GDP, um, is about $300 million. Why am I emphasizing contribution to GDP? Well, it's really easy when you have multiple sectors to double count sales, right? You harvest fish and then you sell them to a dealer, right? You only want to count the value added, right? So in other countries, they have a VAT, a value added tax, um, where your tax basically on the, your contribution to the, the value of fish, right? So if a commercial fisher sells to a dealer who then sells to another dealer, who then sells to another dealer, right? And this, this sort of thing happens in supply chains all the time. You don't wanna just keep counting the value of those sales sold each time because that's not a contribution to the economy. That's just moving stuff around. And the big, when you get these big numbers that seem too big, often what's happening is they're counting those each as individual contributions to the economy and they're not, right? These are actual contributions. So you can see the bulk of the value, right? Comes from actually landing the fish. And that, that makes sense because when you're harvesting a natural resource, right, you're paying zero dollars for it, right, and then you're bringing it all in and then you're selling it. So that gets a big contribution. The processor dealers, right, don't add a huge amount, but that's because they're buying and then reselling, right? And this is they're a, they're just a small step in the supply chain. Um, restaurants and retail, though, do have a lot of contribution, and in part that's because of some of the points Barry was making about local seafood. People really value it and pay a lot for it, and so. This is for the seafood sold in the state, right? And so you go and buy North Carolina seafood at the grocery store, or you go and buy, you know, have a have a seafood dinner. Uh, that makes a pretty big contribution to the state's economy too, because you're not only paying for the fish, but you're paying, you know, to the extent that your dinner is fish related, right? Maybe maybe fifty percent or forty percent of the cost of your dinner is seafood related. We attribute the carry on benefits of that, right? The the employment, all the things the restaurant's doing to that fish. So it's bringing a lot of value to, to the state. Um, and then about 5,000 5, jobs direct, full-time jobs directly, directly related. Um, so that's the overall um, impact. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I have on the right-hand side, I have some details on estimation and things like that. I think, I think what I'll do, so, is just summarize and we'll, we'll jump right through this. So we did a bunch of stuff starting in, in 2020, right? Right during the start of the pandemic, we had a Barry and, and, and that side of the group did a bunch of, uh, of choice sur surveys about the value of NC seafood. We did a, uh, then Chris Dumas at uh, UNC Wilmington did a harvester survey where we asked the harvesters how, the, how their process worked. And then we did a restaurant and retail survey. So we had a bunch of surveys going on. Um, we're asking about 2019. And so all the results here are about 2019, which ended up being pretty good because then things got really messed up. So this is like the last last good year of data before we got messed up. Now we might be back at the point where we could we could do this again um, as things start to start to do better. But I think there's still some some churn. So all these numbers are from 2019, but Again, at least leading up to 2019, these, these things didn't change that much. There's not huge changes from year to year, um, except when there's things like pandemics and things like that. Um, so for commercial fishing, um, we, you know, you estimate, you estimate total sales, right? And so this is this is where these numbers come in. And remember there, the impact is more, right? So for commercial fishing, you you have your total sales and then you have, you know, sort of all the stuff that goes into commercial fishing and how that goes out in the economy, right? So if you're buying fuel and someone works at the at the, the gas station where you're buying the fuel um, and things like that, that all distributes out in the company, their income counts into this. And there's ways that that this is adjusted, right? Um, processor dealers, right? So their sales, you can see how high their sales are, right? Relative to their impact. This is because they make a lot of sales and, and so on. So I'm gonna, I've got five minutes. So I'll skip through the methodology because what I really want to talk about is some of the context for the results. Um, so first, the comparison to recreational fishing, right? So 2017, there was a NOAA economic impact assessment that arrived at about 1.25 billion 
the state GDP, right? That's a comparable number to the 300 million um, contribution to GDP for recreational fishing. But if you break that down into the different sectors, right? About a billion of that is for shore-based fishing and 211 million is boat-based recreation, right? So the commercial recreation or the commercial fishing industry boat is, is primarily boat-based is slightly larger in terms of impact than the boat-based recreational fishery, but they're both on the same, approximately the same scale. But only 60 million of the contribution is for higher boats, while 151 million is for private boats. So if you think about when you say fishing in North Carolina, and you think about boats going out and catching fish, that's primarily going to be commercial, right? Even though recreational fishing is a really important economic driver in the state, most of it's shore-based, and that, that that's not shore-based, most of it is people going out in their private boats uh, and fishing. Um, so the other things to remember are environmental challenges affect both sectors, right? So loss of population, having to cut quotas and things like that, you know, not being able to find fish, that affects both sectors. Um, and there's complementaries in production between sectors, right? So especially, um, Ports and things rely on a certain number of boats and both recreational and, uh, or guide, you know, for hire boats, private boats and commercial fishing boats all create enough boats in an area to, to drive the port, right? Comparison to ag commodities, right? Seafood's between cotton and wheat, it's, right? More than wheat, but much less than, much less than soybeans, right? So it's an important, important contributor in the state, right? In terms of food production. All right, so again, I'm just gonna run through, these. I have three minutes left. The impact in the north part of the state is greater than 1% of GDP, right? So the north part of the state, this is the part of the state where commercial fishing has the most impact. You say 1% doesn't seem that large. It's pretty large. It's a pretty important sector in the economy to think about. There's not that many firms doing commercial fishing. And so it's, a, it's an important part of the north, north coast's economy. It's about half a percent of GDP in the central coast and only about 0.1% of GDP in, this, in the south coast, right? Um, all right. And so then we can break it down by a different fish. I actually have a summary slide, so I'm gonna jump, jump to that. Um, well, let's, let's talk about oysters real quick because we did an impact study for uh, wild, or for, uh, aquaculture for mariculture for uh, raised oysters. So we can kind of break it down. So you can see over time, the red and orange are the farmed, right? And the, the green and yellow are the wild caught. And so you can see over time, this huge increase in farmed oysters and uh, especially, right? So this is something that's only happened in the last, you know, five years or so that there's, there's been a big impact. So if we look at the total impact of about, $27 million from, right, oysters and mariculture, or sorry, oysters and clams, uh, the impact from mariculture. Uh, see if I have a total impact. Yeah, total impact is about 14 million. So it's a little over half of the impact from oysters comes from mariculture. One minute left, we'll get to our key takeaways, right? There's extensive impact the harvesting sector is the most important in terms of impact in the state, but there's extensive impact beyond. Um, and that's coming from restaurants and retails. And that's really where the potential for additional value, right? There's not more fish to be caught, right? Or sort of like, you know, fish stocks are not unlimited. So there's not more fish to be caught, but there is value to be made by moving more of the fish into high value markets. If, if and it seems like from the, the seafood study, those markets, you know, Raleigh and Charlotte and places like that can accept more local fish and create more value that way. Um, the downstream impacts are different for the different types of fish. And this is the point I wanna emphasize before we finish up. So fin fish, right? North Carolina fin fish go out and they go, they're sold both at restaurants and retail in the state, right? So both of those outlets are important. Shrimp, very little of that impact is coming from restaurants, right? North Carolina shrimp is going to markets, it's going to grocery stores and people are buying it there. As opposed to oysters, which are 
not, you know, less, many fewer people are buying them at markets. Most people get their North Carolina oysters in North Carolina at restaurants. And so their, their impacts going from restaurants. And then the blue crab, which is, I think the most valuable fishery by single fishery by value for harvesting, hardly any of that stays in the state, right? So that goes elsewhere. And so the impact is being generated only from the harvest, not from being consumed in the state. Um, and because harvest is important, North Carolina, coastal North Carolina sees the most impact. But like I said, um, the potential for greater impact is coming from moving the, the food that's exiting the state or going into lower value, you know, sort of North Carolina seafood isn't as valuable if it's, you know, going elsewhere to North Carolina economic impact, right? It's most valuable if it's used in the state. And so um, the potential is, is really getting the seafood to, to the inland cities where there's, you know, wealthy consumers who are willing to pay a lot uh, to enjoy it. Um, and then just to sort of set up the, uh, the, uh, the next talks, or some of the next talks. Um, the EIA, and I, I mentioned the EIA is not really a, a strong economic analysis. It gives you an overview, right? But it's not gonna tell us about a marginal set allocation of TAC or allocation between sectors, right? And then one of the things that came up a lot is, you know, if this is a really valuable part of the economy, right? it doesn't tell us how much that value is at risk due to environmental issues. Uh, and the key one, the key issues as, as I see them are climate change, which we don't have much control over whether climate changes. Uh, so that one's difficult. We have more control over the pollution that's coming out of the rivers into the, into the sound. And so both of those things I think are important to, to keep in mind about the, how much of that $300 million is at risk because of these environmental issues and, and how are we gonna deal with that? And that economic impact analysis can't answer that, but I think it does, it does emphasize that's an important question. So, sorry, I took an extra minute, but thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I almost called on you. Yeah. Uh, for your table, that's where you had the different because the seafood number on the this one? how does that number derive? For instance, does that include what fish or farm raised oysters in that? Is that just like the shell pump Yeah, so this food? is yeah, this is this is the the three hundred million dollars. So these are as comparable as I I could get. Um so the three hundred million dollars is kind of total contribution to GDP of all the you know, restaurants and retail plus the processors plus the, the harvest. Yeah. Um, and you think about some of these other, so for instance, why are cotton and tobacco, those are not necessarily the biggest crops in the state. Why are they up there? Well, those require a lot of um, more processing in the state, right? And so those contribute to the economic impact. And this is, this is one of the things about economic impact that why it may not be, you know, a farmer might be better off growing soybeans because that brings the farmer the most value. And that's probably best for the economy. But that doesn't mean that brings the most jobs and things linked to soybeans in North Carolina. They don't require that much processing. Tobacco and cotton require a lot of processing. Um, and so, yeah, so, so the way to think about this is, um, I, the way I like to think about it is like, I would not have thought that seafood had more value to North Carolina, contributed more to GDP than wheat. I just, I would have thought ag, I mean, and peanut, I mean, we talk a lot about wheat and peanuts. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of structure around agriculture. There's a lot of, you know, organizations and things. And um, seafood is a very important uh, piece of the kind of the food, food value chain as well. Um, and I, I think that's what I emphasize. Just to add, um, the mariculture industry, the oyster industry has about the same impact as bell peppers in the state. So small, but again, it's, it's interesting to compare, you know, sort of the fish and the, the seafood commodities to agricultural commodities. I think it's important. Uh, you talked at the last slide about the environmental impact of climate change. Mm -hmm. Most of the is breaking. So is there any study that will be 
the JCL is hosting a sample your um digital token of the exist of the index position there. Yeah. So that's the first question. The second question is I see that there's a lot of trade in the JSEC in both screenshot and self region. Mm -hmm. Was there any of the required data in the index so that we can look at the freelance currency versus test compare? Yes. So the first question is good. And I, I think what you're asking me is whether there is like, what's the economic impact of a hurricane on? There's a lot, I don't, I haven't seen any study that one of the issues there is the hurricane does a lot of things. Um, and so thinking like, what was the impact on the fishing industry? Um, you, you probably need to do some biological modeling in order to, to figure out what was, you know, cause you can think about, you know, what was the effect on the fish stocks? Um, and what was the effect on the ability to get out versus, you know, people are just evacuated or can't fish. I, I don't, I don't know if there's a turn that. The second question we have, we don't have that published anywhere, the breakout by county. I can, if you email me, I can sort of back it out for you. I, I've done that for, for one, I don't remember which county, um, in the North, in the North area. Um, but yeah, we don't have it broken out by county, but, um, you, the, the way you, the way it's set up is it's just sort of, you'd allocate that by sort of the, the total amount of, of value in that GDP in that county. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious with this NOAA and economic uh, impact assessment, um, how the value would we ascribe to you know, things like private boat catch? Uh, how do you put a value on the fish that was caught with food and then from that home? Yeah, so, so, it's complicated. They have you. You come up with the way they do it over time. Eventually, as you get these multipliers of like what you think the value is. How would an economist go about getting those numbers initially? Those multipliers initially. You do things like a travel cost estimation, where you look at how far are people driving to catch fish. So you're getting the fish for free. That's creating some surplus. So you're willing to you know. The greater that surplus is, the, the more benefit you get out of fishing, the more trips you take, the further you're willing to go. And there's methods to do that to figure out. So yeah, so even though recreational fishers aren't selling their fish, they're willing to spend a lot. And there's a lot of value of that, right? So they're spending money at hotels, they're driving a long ways, people are, you know, chartering boats, things like that. Yeah. We will probably have some time after the session to ask more questions of our our speakers, so Jerry, can we thank you? All right, so my name is Jerry Arbelio. I'm one of two fishery specialists at North Carolina Sea Grant. Part of our job function is what I call the how do we fix this science. So the, the, it's applied science. It's not the gee whiz, how does something fit? It's addressing some kind of user need, societal need, whether it's a resource manager, or in our case, um, our fishing sectors. And it's the bottom line is to have a seafood economy, like Eric just talked about, while actually meeting some of the conservation and management challenges. So can we have co-production of ideas? So I do a lot of gear research, and I'm just gonna talk to you about my little friend, the shark deterrent, or some people are calling it the shark tickler. I don't know, <laughs> but um, I wanna thank the National Sea Grant Office, John Pennick in the back room. This was actually funded through their uh, 2019 Highly Migratory Species Research Initiative that funded this. And you should know I got two more years of funding through the Sonstall Kennedy program. So leveraging your money, thank you. I also want to acknowledge some of my co-authors, Dr. Richard Brill. He is actually affiliated scholar at the Department of Fisheries at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Peter Bushnell, who is emeritus professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Indiana University South Bend. And Amanda Wilson is actually the executive director of a private company called Ocean Guardian. And they're the manufacturer of devices that use their patented shark shield technology and they're headquartered in New South Wales, Australia. We also did conduct this under two institutional animal care and use committee protocols, both with William and Mary and with NC State University. And all the sharks in this project were mostly caught and released, but those that were harvested were under the fisherman's direct, directed shark limited access permit, 
SKD209. So he is able to actually retain and sell his charts in this project. So let's get started. Headline, I like to hit you with the punch. E-birds or electronic bycatch reduction devices or birds could save sharks. I'm here to tell you this. So we have data to support that the hypothesis that programmable electronic bycatch reduction devices that create an electric field, boom, um, will deter sharks from a baited fishing hook and can therefore reduce shark bycatch in longline fisheries globally. Here's our motivation. A lot of you sharks are always in the press. Uh, in 2013, there was a scientific findings released in the journal Marine Policy that estimated the number of sharks killed annually in commercial fisheries was around 100 million. And that number is still used presently by most media outlet, outlets when they do shark press. Now, recent data suggests that the Lasmerbank catches have actually fallen roughly about 14% since the peak in 2003. But nonetheless, we can argue that shark bycatch remains a problem in longline fisheries worldwide. A new paper in Nature in January 2021 indicated the abundance of oceanic rays and sharks had declined by 71% since 1970, and principally due to increased fishing pressure. And here are some of the sharks that are commonly uh, caught incidentally and unintentionally, and it is the dusky, the oceanic white tip, sandbar, scalloped hammerhead, and the short fin mako. Now, I want to emphasize, since we were talking about money before, this isn't just a resource management issue, okay? This is an economic issue. I talked to one pelagic longline fisherman, fisherman, and he said conservatively, the damage to his gear, the increased time to retrieve his gear, the fact that some of his target catch, like um, tunas and swordfish, were being eaten by the sharks, he estimated an annual loss of $175,000 between increased gear retrieval time, damage to his gear, and loss of a big, big eye tuna, for example. I mean, a big eye tuna on the sushi market, for those that don't know, a single fish could be $15,000 to $20,000. And a shark takes a big chomp, and you just lost $20,000. So they want to fix to this as much as the biologists want to fix. So here's the thing. A mitigation approach, sensory biology, for those you know, let's try to use a unique difference in sharks as a deterrent to them. And so sharks possess this sort of like sixth sense, if you want to call it that. They actually can detect uh, electric fields, and I'll put, here's a little chart for you, in the range of how they use their different senses. In that short, less than half a meter range, they tend to detect an electric field. As I say to all the students, we're electric. That's right, we are heartbeat and everything. We ourselves are electric. We put off small electric fields, everything that breathes and moves. And so they use this for um, prey capture, also predator avoidance. And they have all those pits in their nose back here. Well, back again, gel-like fluid sacs in their nose and around their mouth area. And that conducts that electric field. And that's how they sense. Now, targeted teleos or bony fish do not have this. So the big eye tuna, the swordfish, they're going after, do, they do not have this. So this does not affect them in any kind of biological way. So this is unique and it's exploiting this difference. We'll skip forward to that. I mean, this was just for a previous talk, but we got the funding in 2019. Uh, COVID was not our friend. Thank you for the numerous no cost extensions national office to do this. We finally got the work done in summer of 2021. And I wrapped in December of last year, the field work portion of it. Now, one thing I want you to notice, outreach, education across the bottom, that was important in all ways of this project. You know, from the very beginning, talking with our commercial fisher partner, 
and doing publicity out there, getting ahead of some of the misinformation on, cause you know, anything with a shark can people can spin it. So, and we just finished outreach. Um, I presented at the American Elasma Bank Society and a bunch of other uh, key places, this information. All righty, let's get to my, my device here. I brought him in here. So when you're working with commercial fisher, you want something that's not too expensive or they're not going to use it. Too much money for them to buy it, they're not going to buy the conservation here. Take up too much room on the deck, they're not going to use the conservation here. If you make it it's too burdensome in any way, you're not going to use the conservation. So this is what's fast. This is where I get excited. It's only for a minute. This, people have been whacking on this for years. They use magnets, which are true magnets, electropositive metals make an electric field. Well, guess what happens with a magnet and what? A steel hole bolt, a metal prop, electronics, okay? The magnet messed all that up. Guess what else? Magnets throw in the seawater. So people were throwing this out with the baby with the bathwater. Oh, this is a pipe dream, never work. This doesn't really work. Go into our century, and I now have, we have microprocessor boards that are the size of the thumb. That's what this is, that was on $5. This whole housing, 3D printed, 3D printers. So if we wanted to change the housing, just resent it to the computer, reprinted a new housing design. So it really allows you to take these ideas and now we can relook at them, revisit them and keep going. So compact in size, programmable, that microprocessor board has a micro USB, I can put any kind of programming on it, easy to handle, three AA batteries, and in theory, watertight to, at this point, only 100 feet. That's one of the things we have to improve. It puts off a pinging pattern between two and six hertz, and it is a 3.3 volt coming out from carbon fiber rods embedded in the housing, and I call it, it's like an electric dog fence, almost like a thing, like a barrier. So there's a little bubble here, and that's why it's so close, because it's a trade-off between battery power and electric field, how much you make that field. So right now it's within 15 centimeters or six inches of this baited hook. And so you're having an electric field around here that the shark detects. Going bottom long line. As I said, the fisherman I used, he actually harvests sharks. We use a bottom long line. This is not the pelagic long line. You think of the high seas that go after swordfish and tunas. You know, field science, you need a lot of data because there's a lot of variability to make statistical conclusions. So I went with a directed shark fisherman because all we were going to catch all day long was sharks. And I needed a high sample size to make some conclusive remarks. Yeah, there we go. Uh, just keep going with that. Six inches. All right. So here we go. We had a total of nine different sharks that we interacted with in the study. Of ranging sizes, our shark, you know, we had some smaller ones, um, some black tip sharks are on the smaller size, black nose on the smaller size, shark nose really small. We had a behemoth great hammerhead on the line, probably three times, two times the size of me. So that was interesting to me, first of all, that I was working on your small and large coastal shark complexes. And the fisherman kept saying, it's not going to catch, it's not fishy enough, the thing is too close to the hook, but we did catch nine different kinds of sharks. And here's the opportunity in numbers, I don't know if you call it. So you had nine different shark species, a total of 141 sharks in this study design across those nine species. And what I wanted to show you is, you know, this is a coin toss. And I want to, because sometimes this science it trips people up, this so this is a paired design. I would do a hook with one device, and I'm telling that device through programming to make an electric field. And then about 20 feet away is another hook, same exact device in all other ways that to tell it don't make an electric field. I love paired sample designs because everything this hook was experiencing, this hook should be experiencing. Same water temperature, same current that day, same bottom depth that day. So one can assume that any changes you see are directly related to the fact that I told one to make an electric field and one not to make an electric field. So we actually saw a 
an aggregate, okay, that almost all the sharks were on the de control device, the device that did not make an electric field, okay? Some of the species like black tip, it was 85% of all the black tip sharks caught were on the device that was considered the control that made no electric field. There were a couple of sharks that brought the number down, but overall, you only have two options, shark on or shark off. It's a coin toss, 50-50 probability. Randomly in nature, you have a 50-50 chance a shark's gonna have your hook, all right? So that's what that top number is. So you have a, your hypothetical probability is 50-50. And what I observed on the hooks that actually had an electric field was only 24%. That's an aggregate. For some species, that number was much higher which overall then results in a 51% 50 bycatch reduction. I, I want you to follow that because it's not just the number we're reporting, it's the reduced bycatch over the normal 53 probability. And you can see it was very significant, P to the zero, 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 and on to seven. And this is nice because now we don't have to talk about area closures. We don't have to talk about reduced catch amounts, put other kind of gear mandates, hook mandate hook types, other things with something like this. The next step, I'll just introduce the shark tickler. That's what the lab actually introduced. My colleague, Peter Bushnell, actually was giving a presentation at his staff meeting, his faculty meeting. And there's actually a physicist at Indiana University South Bend who does black hole theory in a bunch. I said, Oh, this is fascinating from an electronic, you know, physics electronic standpoint. I have some students that would like to just tinker with this. And lo and behold, in the mail, I got these devices that they then wrote, said, here's your shark ticklers. So I'm like, okay. Um, the nice thing, it has, operates on a similar kind of principle. The nice thing is it's made from regular, like normal plumbing supplies. Um, you almost could just send a fisherman the brains or the fisherman could buy the brains and then make the housing himself. Um, because of the plumbing and the way it is, it has a little bit better watertight integrity. Um, we're gonna be able to do it from 3.3 volt to a five volt board and hopefully increase that electric field over what we're calling the OG or Ocean Guardian prototype. And they were able to do a lot more with their board in the way of making it think so it's in a dormant state like this one, I had to actually engage every single one and turn it on like that. This one has a, they programmed it so it sent salt water through their carbon fiber rods and will turn on automatically through salt water activation. And for anybody, the reason the green light is, this was also a two for, two for one. A lot of uh, pelagic longline fishermen that go after the swordfish in the tunas, they fish in very deep, deep water. And so they'll use a light stick or some kind of a light attractant device so that the big eye and the swordfish see that and kind of come up to the gear. And so again, the name of the game is not adding more gear, not adding more conservation gear, not adding more cost to the operation. So I said, well, let's see if we can kill two birds with one stone and build in the light attractant with the shark deterrent. So that's what, and green was the color that they all said works best. So we just programmed it to do green. That's why this is on. But the shark tickler, you don't have to do that. Once it hits salt water and it will tell, it actually will also tell you if battery's low, it has a flash pattern. It's really much more sophisticated. So that is what I'm doing with the next two years of my funding. And I'm actually gonna put that on a pelagic, two pelagic longliners, one out of Oregon Inlet and one um, that fishes in New England, but his home port is Cape May, New Jersey. And this, I just put a link at the end. We were lucky enough that PBS North Carolina, their SciNC or Science North Carolina, they wrote out with us during the study and did a nice little feature about this project. So if you want to see some of the real infield work, um, you can go to that link. So with that, I'll take questions. Any questions for Sarah? Yes, go ahead. So, um, I was just wondering, I thought, I would have thought the sharks were 
Okay, so the thing is, it's like the, it's, I mean, I don't know the exact biology, so I can't interview a shark and tell me what you're saying. Um, there's two ways of thinking. Um, one is they know what's a normal field. And all of a sudden I have something, you saw that it was, not only is it just a 3.3 volt field, but it's going between two Hertz and six Hertz. And I did that because we've seen marine mammals and lights, pingers and stuff, they could get habituated to it. And then all of a sudden it almost becomes like the dinner bell. So the pinger that worked at first to share dolphin from a gill net, all of a sudden the dolphins predate more on the gill net. So that was also, we're thinking if we constantly change it up, it's two, it's six, it's three, it's four, it's off for a hundred milliseconds, on for a hundred milliseconds, one that can't habituate. And two, I think they just realized when they go, they're like unsure of it. They don't know, what is this thing? I've never experienced this in an environment, it's strong. Um, some people say like the tickler, oh, it may have some kind of physical properties. I don't think so. I don't think it's that strong an electric field to make a physical kind of like pain or sting. I just think it's they, and we have aerial video, which I didn't, they did tank trials with this way before we did field trials. In the tank trials, they had a baited hook with the device and a baited hook without. And in the triangle, you see the shark, he's curious and he goes up to it and then he just swims away, goes up, swims away, he keeps going up and swims away, but he never goes for it. And then we finally had one shark who went for it after like five tries of just like investigating and then he never went back. So I don't know what's really happening, but I think it's foreign. They know what they're experiencing every day. And I think they're just saying, hey, this is weird. This is not normal. It's not what I experienced, but. So my whole thing was, what, which I made very clear to, to Ocean Guardian and any partner I work with, this is public funding and Sea Grant is about, um, doesn't mean that you can't patent, certainly we've had some researchers over the years patent, but I told them, I said, you know, this is going to be open source, it's public funding um, information. Now I think every uh, company will put their own razzle dazzle on it if, when it, if and when it goes to the retail market and claim it as theirs, but but this concept of the sensory biology has been out there for a while. And so, um, but yeah, I, don't, I personally will not be patenting, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So how much is that model? Okay, yeah, uh, great question. So this was a lot of man hours because first of all, it took like, I wanna say 12 hours or something from start to finish the print, 3D print the housing and have it pure. And then a man, uh, the electrical engineer had to go in and literally program every one of these boards and connect it. So it really wasn't in the material as much as it was in the man hours for a mechanical engineer and electrical engineer are not cheap. So a finished device is about $100 for all of this. That device, you don't have any of the housing you have to print, you no know, mechanical engineer, cheap plumbing supplies, it's you still have to program them. You can't get around that. Um, but the academic, you know, I think it will probably be closer to about forty dollars finished versus a hundred. Obviously, that's still too much for the retail market. But uh, once you, if you built your own chip, okay, once you figure out your chip and you like the way your chip, you can actually make custom design chips, and that's a hell of a lot cheaper than having it's already got the program built on. So there's definitely ways to reduce costs. If you want to go with this, you can make an injection mold housing. And then the mold itself is part expensive at first, but then it's really cheap to be housing. So I think it definitely could be in the $30 range on the shelf. And that's what some of the light attractants currently are. Farming systems, and she will be talking on um, internships and how we use these internships to help businesses engage in e-commerce. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Uh, a little bit of an introduction, more introduction to myself. I'll be very honest that um, pre-2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, I knew very little about North Carolina fisheries. 
and was kind of thrown into it. Uh, I worked a little bit with the, I work with the statewide food council in Newberry and Barry was always reminding me to think about fisheries and think about North Carolina coastal systems. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like actually knowing a lot about it, um, I didn't know a whole lot and was uh, then COVID-19 happened and was forced to learn a little bit. So I want to just kind of give myself that background. And I am really grateful to Barry for all that he has taught me. And like, I'm um, a huge fan of North Carolina seafood and fisheries and supporting uh, fisheries more. So uh, as we all know, COVID-19 uh, changed the way everybody was accessing food, was buying food, preparing food. You know, I think around, man, man, I used to could like pull these statistics off the top of my head, but something around like 50% of the meals in the U.S. were consumed in restaurants from pre-COVID-19 down to about 5%. So, and then, or restaurants or, um, you know, cafeterias, school food, a lot of our food meals, that went away overnight. And, you know, seafoods, 95% of North Carolina seafood, as you all probably know, is consumed in restaurants. And that went away overnight. So I had, um, because I work a little bit in food systems and in supply chains, I had fishermen calling me up and being like, I have a load of uh, soft shell crab. Can you help me get rid of it? And I was like, I have no idea what to do. Uh, and, but we started having these conversations and bringing in one of the things that we saw because of statewide food council was direct marketing folks across the state i work more with farmers so that's kind of my background is working in agriculture and we were seeing that farmers and um restaurant places that had online sales as a way for people to advertise on social media and sell their stuff like you know through square or some sort of online platform were doing well. And those that were not, that didn't have online presences, social media, Facebook, and a method, a way for people to buy stuff online, were really struggling. And so we were like, okay, how can we support folks across the state to better get their online presence, to, you know, increase accessibility? Uh, so we were, we were hearing this all across the state. Uh, I just also want to say a little bit about the North Carolina seafood our North Carolina Local Food Council. So we're uh, a statewide local food council and we're made up of members across the state that work in food systems. Everyone from Sea Grant to Extension to farmer's market managers, um, Farm Bureau, food banks, all, and we were all like, coming together actually once or twice a week to talk about pinch points we were seeing in the food system. And so folks struggling with sales was across the state. Um, so an idea we had was develop this remote internship to support enterprises for local foods, which we called RISE. And the goal here was a lot of students had lost their jobs. Um, because I also teach at NC State, I was meeting students who were like emailing me and be like, can I volunteer? Or do you have any job opportunities? Uh, students were struggling. You know, a lot of students who were just like worked at the gym or the cafeteria, like lost their jobs overnight. And that was an important income source. and uh, farmers, fishermen were all struggling. And these students had like, for them, social media, Facebook, you know, maybe building a website was all super easy. So we developed this idea for this internship program to match students and uh, food businesses and to help them improve their technology, social media skills and connections, and really just to improve, improve direct marketing access. Uh, we had six of them across the state and one was with Sea Grant. Uh, and I will say that these students didn't necessarily have a background in uh, communications or business or in uh, seafood. Actually, the student that worked with Sea Grant, Sienna, was a um, environmental science student at UNC and was just really like looking for a job, wanted to get some experience. She was like, I lost my internship opportunity. I have no experience. I'm going to graduate next year. I like, I will do whatever it takes. I need some experience. I want to learn. I, I do social media a lot and website stuff. And we we're like, great. Uh, and she was fantastic. Um, so just our goals here were to enhance commercial viability of local farms, fisheries, and producers by providing training and technological support 
for direct marketing and improving their online presence. And at the same time, provide university students with meaningful and paid experiences that develop hands-on skills related to food systems operations. And because you know Zoom was becoming more popular and all this were helping with social media, everything was remote. And so we had so students all over the state working with producers all over the state, which was, and they were talking on the phone, they were talking on Zoom, they were texting. And so COVID-19 really like folks were safe and supported. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the impacts. So in less than six months, we had students who had never worked in this, never worked with farmers really, uh, and fishers, make over 50 graphics, eight videos, 15 newsletters, 10 guides and different presentations, four separate websites. I believe all of those websites were fisheries related and five community surveys. And I will say this was a uh, $20,000 grant. If we paid, anyone wanna guess how much you're gonna spend if you're gonna like pay consultants to do this work? I will say it did take more time and time investment and more training with these students. Um, but I think, you know, the investment there, it was so Sea Grant put in, so it was a $20,000 grant from Self-Help Credit Union and Sea Grant put in 3,000, the State Food Council put in 3,000. So I think around 26,000 total. Um, it's up to y'all to decide if it was a good investment or not. Um, oh, the wrong, wrong direction. Yeah. So, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, personal, Barry can talk a lot more about this, but uh, this is a quote that I really like. Rise was hugely beneficial to my recipients who are sharing their deliverables with friends, family, and associates to the extent I'm still getting requests for website assistance. And there's a strong ongoing need for technology assistance among seafood products that another Rise effort can satisfy. Uh, another person that worked with Sienna said the Sienna and the Rise Project helped us take our website to the next level and tell our story. Uh, I think folks who'd never had a website before now have websites and um, some folks started selling direct market that they'd never sold direct market and are thinking about their business opportunities in a whole different way just because of these students. And because I teach and I'm really interested in, you know, thinking about the career paths and exposing folks to futures in food systems and agriculture and seafood, I also really wanna highlight the impact on students. Sienna says, throughout this internship, I have learned so much about my community and my local food system. I have a much better understanding of the level of support that local growers need, especially in the wake of pandemic. I've expanded my knowledge of seafood production, which is something that is well outside of my area of expertise. Going forward, I plan to continue working with, within my community and the marketing knowledge that I gained during this internship will help me with that. Sienna is now working in communications with food systems organizations as a pr profession, which is nothing she had thought about before. Um, another student that participated in this internship is now starting an agritourism industry for her own family farm. She would, did not wanna work on the farm. Uh, she wanted to get as far away as possible. And so, I just want to like encourage all of you that are, have work in organizations and industry and business, like think about internship. This is our future. A lot of students are not interested in working in fisheries or seafood or agriculture. They want to get away from it. And I think they need that personal connection. And, but they're also, a lot of students are looking for something, a way to make a difference. And like look, connecting fishers, working with seafood fisheries, people, this is an opportunity to make a huge difference. And I think the skills that they have often, like I know I work, my background again is more with farmers, but I've seen it a lot with fishermen and seafood organizations that technology isn't their strong suit. And that's okay. Students like have it, they're so good at it. And so like, I think it's just a natural connection, but I just wanna like push more. Um, so again, with our next steps is uh, we are still kind of hoping, we haven't unfortunately uh, that funding dried up, but we are hoping to continue RISE or other similar programs so that y'all, you know, any good, anyone's interested in writing a grant, let me know. But I will say the success of the RISE project helped the NCLC, the State Food Council 
get funding from CDC, we use that as grant funding to develop another internship program that is uh, working with food councils. And so the statewide food council has an intern right now that is again, working with Sea Grant. And it's a public health uh, graduate student from UNC uh, that's working with Sea Grant and currently helping, uh, working with the Visit NC Farms app, continuing the work. So it's a little bit different, but I we are hoping to continue that. And um, I think that there's just a lot of opportunities for the future. And that's, I think I'm well under time. I was uh, sorry to be so short, but hopefully there might be a few questions. And Barry has a, might be able to say more. First of all, I just want to say, are there any questions for I to remind you now? Um, Jesus, uh, your presentation. Yes. Oh, students were helping them uh, set up. I remember students telling me about phone calls. I were on a phone and like helping somebody set up like a little, you know, the little square app and they're like, I can't get it to work. And they're like literally like talk, talking to the help desk on their phone and then like on Zoom talking to the producer trying to set up. Um, yeah, so definitely a lot of students helped them set up kind of square or would even do a lot of them did kind of I know of a specific table comparing different methods of payment and like different apps you can get that they made. So they could just hand people like, here's some of the pros and cons. You wanna like, which one do you want? And I can help set it up uh, or different online vendors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you pull your students? Oh, we, yeah. So I, I, my background is kind of working in internships and um, so, but we, all across the state, we have kind of networks that we tried to hit made every public university in the state and community colleges kind of across as well. And I think we had students at App State, UNC, uh, UNC Charlotte, NC State, and one at UNC Wilmington, I think not. Uh, so just kind of networks and then like trying to hit undergraduate coordinators and departments that we knew like at different universities, just sending emails out and it was and this I will say like we had I think like 50 or 60 applications and the application was open for two weeks which for students is like pretty short um and during the school year so it was, this was all like done pretty quickly yeah I didn't mention that Yeah, so the way we worked is we worked with producer organizations, so farmers markets, mostly food hubs and Sea Grant. So we had a student that was paired with Sea Grant and very connected with the fisher, like that's not our expertise and we wanted the folks who work directly with producers to like find the connections. Um, so Barry, we all went through Barry. So I guess basically what I'd like to do is just uh, bring up one really good success story out of this. They were all success, good success stories, but um, some of you may know Man Mesquite Seafood out in Swan Quarter, uh, and Hyde County is a very rural area of North Carolina, and they had gotten into some value-added uh, products, specifically their crab cakes, which they were selling a lot of in the uh, food service trade. When uh, that went down, they didn't know where else to go. We helped them uh, get a website established, and now they're able to sell their crab cakes directly to consumers anywhere in or out of state. And so it's been what they're developing here is a direct marketing customer base beyond just their food service customers that are now coming back to them now that the pandemic has wound down. But um, I talked to the owners there, and they said this website is great. They, they didn't know where to go to get a website set up, um, but Sienna listened to them, uh, 
very carefully about what they wanted, um, understood that they did not have uh, a lot of expertise with technology. So she set them up with a platform that was easy to uh, edit uh, and gave them a, a pay method that uh, was easy to use as well. So um, they're very happy with the website and it's given them an opportunity to uh, get visibility for their products across the state and not just on the eastern half of the state which is where they were selling their products prior to the pandemic. This has been a great partnership. I, I cannot speak any more highly of the North Carolina Local Food Council and Angel's leadership. Um, this program really did help our, our seafood businesses when they needed it most, and uh, it continues to help people now that we're working uh, with an intern on the uh, uh, Visit North Carolina Farms app project too. Any other questions? Okay, well, again, thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Ann Savage, and she is a tourism extension specialist with NC State University, and she's going to be talking about leveraging direct marketing uh, and tourism to diversify income streams for seafood producers. Good morning, everyone, and I will start my presentation similarly to how Angel did and say, uh, before I came onto this project, I did not know very much about the fisheries industry. Uh, Barry is by far more well-rounded in that. Um, this project came about as a great partnership, and not all of the Sea Grant folks that are on this project are on the title page because it would have been very small. Frank Lopez, Scott Barker, uh, Eric Herbst, John from Carteret County, whose last name escaped me, John Islet. They're they're all a part of this, all a part of our meetings, um, and so. Um, We'll get into it. So the project objective, so this came together um, kind of in the pandemic midst. Um, and really the goal was similar to what we've heard to support the commercial fishers and marine aquaculture producers with their direct to consumer marketing. And there were two kind of key thoughts in doing this. One was that there was an untapped potential with the Visit and See Farms app, which had a lot of farms across the state on it, but not a lot of fisheries representation. Um, and then also to, to leverage the, the popularity of the Visit and See, the, the NC Oyster Trail, um, and continue that um, development and supporting those members as they, they look into tourism ventures and continue to uh, develop their direct marketing opportunities. So we were interested in this. This is similar to what we've seen from a lot of people pre-pandemic. 75% of U.S. seafood was consumed, sold in food service, so the restaurants. So obviously when restaurants closed, that shut off a lot of opportunity for the producers. Um, and so while lower wholesale commerce, uh, while, while wholesale commerce remained low, uh, we, we saw a rise in retail seafood sales, which, which let us know that more consumers were producing seafood, at, or were, were cooking at home <laughs> um, and using seafood at home. Um, so some producers were quick to shift to direct marketing to capitalize on this, but others, as we've heard, needed a little bit more assistance. Um, and so this project was to kind of help um, fill that need. And so the first, the first way we, we worked with it, we worked with the North Carolina Commerce, Ag and Commerce, Consumer Science. I can never remember all the letters there. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> the Department of Ag. To, to work with them to get more seafood producers on the Visit and See Farms app, which is a mobile technology um, that consumers can download and you can find farms, local food retailers, seasonal events that celebrate local food. Um, and it became really popular during the pandemic, a way for people to have those outdoor experiences. They could find farm tours and they were able to really connect with local farms, especially during some of the supply chain issues where you weren't able to access your meats and your eggs and whatnot. Um, so this is a snapshot of the most recent data we had from September about the number of users. So over 8,000 people have active apps on their devices. There were 23,000 screen views in September with over 10,000 asset views. So an asset is one of those um, local food retailers, events. There are um, different trails that are included on the farm app. So th th those are the assets. Um, and people are spending considerable time kind of exploring their regions and the farms that are around there. 
So prior to the project, the, the team at NCC Grant obviously was really dialed into what the needs of the seafood producers were, and they had already identified um, over 100 seafood businesses that could benefit from the app. Um, and so the team got together and held uh, listening sessions or information sessions in, in March and April with uh, different businesses. Um, and they were able to get 24 businesses on the app from that. The goal of the project is to get 30. I think we're still working on getting those extra six. Um, but so we, we had those people on the app. We, we were able to work with the, the, the person who is kind of doing all the marketing in the background, Julie from Yellow Dog. And she was able to update some of the, um, I never remember to use this, update some of the materials to reflect seafood, not just local farms, so that it could be more direct to the seafood producers. They wanted to make sure people had that visual cue of what was what was they were finding on the app. Um, and then we also did a lot of promotion. Um, so that was one of the things that also the Department of Ag was really helpful with, with the v Visit NC Farms app was they were looking at billboards, wraps for ice chest at the coast, um, different materials that could cue people to remember, oh, I should get some seafood before I go home. Let me go to the local seafood market to, to grab some of that. Um, they also did some radio ads and whatnot, and some of them were specific to seafood or they included seafood on them. And so one thing that we've been working on most recently is leveraging the in-app features for those producers that have signed on. So having app notifications, push notifications that are being sent out to users, this is what they look like. Um, and so those can be events that the, the, the producers have or in-season offerings. So making sure people know what's in season, if they're going to the coast, make sure you get your oysters, it's oyster season. Um, so kind of just those, those reminders of, of what they can do. Um, and then also the, the farm app team has been really active and checking in regularly with the, the producers to try to get them conditioned so that they kind of have it in their mind. Oh, this is in season. I need to let the app team know so that they can keep it updated um, and keep our asset view um, the most accurate. And then there are also promotional materials that the team has used for the producers who are on the app or the retailers so that they um, can help promote the app further. Obviously, it only does as good as the people who have it downloaded. So having those spots where people can get, um, the, they're obviously signs and rack cards, but cooler bags when they check out that can remind them, oh, I need to download this app so I can find my seafood later, um, and sweatshirts um, to, to help promote that NC seafood. So the other component of this, and some of this obviously overlaps, we want oyster producers on the, the farm app, and the more people that, that are aware of oysters are probably going to be more in, in, interested in seafood. Um, but so the North Carolina Oyster Trail launched in 2019 or 2020. It was before I started in my position, um, and I had some colleagues in my department who worked with Dr. Jane Harrison on this. Um, and it's a marketing program that's educating the public on the culinary options and ecosystem benefits of sustainable shellfish. Um, and so they they have over 75 members now. That was a big thing at the beginning was pushing for that membership. And this includes folks that offer shellfish farm tours, your mariculture producers, seafood restaurants, um, retailers that have seafood that people can purchase, environmental education organizations that focus on oysters and the benefit of them to the, the community, and then festivals that really highlight oysters. Um, and so if you wanna go to the ncoystertrail.org and find an interactive map if you're going to be traveling to the coast and see um, where you can go buy oysters, where you can go on a farm tour. Um, there's a great map there that, that really helps folks when they're traveling. So the Oyster Trail has a couple main things they've been focusing on. They want guidance on best practices for farm tours because there's been more and more interest for folks um, for this new type of agritourism of going out on mariculture farms and, and seeing kind of what that's like. Um, evaluations are developed for different trail sites so we can kind of do a quality control and make sure that our members are um, are meeting the standards that so that it's a it's a positive experience for everybody involved and then also we have a process for assessment of some some volunteers on the ground to go and also help with that quality control so for the guidance and the development um there was a lot of upfront training to make sure that membership requirements were understood for the different marketing platforms so people were meeting those needs they were keeping their information updated um they're the consumers are aware of what they're looking for. Um, there's been several trainings for members on best marketing practices to benefit their membership. So just kind of things to think about 
getting a website, registering on Google. Um, we're developing a resource right now for best practices for tours so that just things to think about. There's there's some things to think about when you're on land, but then when you take it onto water, there are a lot more things you have to start thinking about. And so that leads into some of just like the basic requirements or places to look when you wanna get a captain's license or when you're interested in liability insurance. We're not experts on that, but just making sure that we lay out that there are necessities there is important. Um, and then a crisis response as we uh, exist in this world, crisis is a part of it. And so making sure that producers have at least some sort of plan in case something happens. The evaluations for the trail site. So these were set up, I believe in March, we launched the evaluation and it's for um, any of the trail sites. And so it's a survey. Um, and they have it at each of the locations, but they also push it out on social media every once in a while to try to remind people, hey, did you visit one of these sites? Let us know how your experience was. If you do, you could win 50 free oysters. So if you've been to a trail site recently, take the QR code and take the survey. It's just five or six questions. Um, and it asks essentially which business you visited, what your um, home zip code is, so we know where they're traveling from, um, what if you had a how satisfied you were with different components of your experience, um, and if you would be more likely to visit it, if you're likely to visit a trail site or tell others about your visit so that we can kind of get a feel for um, if this is promoting the oyster trail. And then lastly is that assessment to do the, the check-in to make sure that we have that quality control of the members. Um, we want to make sure that members are offering things that they're saying on the website. We don't, we want the website to be a valuable tool and we want members to benefit from it. So having some sort of quality control there is valuable for that. Um, so there are volunteers across the coast that are checking in on those um, at least once a year. And then just some additional activities. There's a lot with this project. Um, but one thing we, we've tapped into the Mariner's menu recipe rack cards, um, just trying to think of ways or, or hurdles that consumers may have when they go to purchase seafood, perhaps they're, I don't know what to do with trout. So having those recipes on the app, but also as rack cards in different places so people can say, oh, okay, well, this is easy. I have these ingredients, I'll purchase this. Similarly, we developed a, a, a set of FAQs for the app so that if people are wondering, it has a, a lot of information. Um, we, we tried to prioritize it based off of kind of what's most important, but talking about what's in season, what to look for if you're purchasing this product, just so we understand that people might not be so comfortable. I mean, before I started on this project, I probably wasn't very comfortable purchasing some seafood. And so it's nice to have that available so people are more willing to, to take it. And then, oh, Social media, so I was gonna highlight the work that the, the intern did, but I think we just did that. We have the intern that's supporting the, the folks on the app, helping them with their websites and whatnot from the local food council. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so just a continuation. And so that, that's been a, a nice uh, piece for the producers that have signed on to the app. Um, and then obviously the, the two entities, both the Visit NC Farms app and the North Carolina Oyster Trail are supporting each other on social media, promoting each other, making sure that um, those, those assets are being promoted as well. And so the next steps for the team, this is the big hurdle that we have is, is, is really getting an understanding of how people are engaging with the seafood businesses on the app. And then if they're, they're patronizing the seafood businesses that they have downloaded or whatnot on the app. So we're, we're coming up with a few ways to, to, to try to assess that, but that's, that's the big um, next step. And then obviously to just continue these businesses with things that come up, thinking of other customer needs to help um, folks continue purchasing. And uh, this messed up a little bit, but you can download the Visit and See Farms app if you don't have it. <laughs> and thank y'all. There are, I know there are oyster farmers that are doing, I'm, I'm not sure if there are other fisheries that are doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are a handful, but they're all kind of looking into it and getting more interested. So we just want to try to have some of those materials up front. So when they start it, they're able to think through like, do you really want customers? Like you have to prepare, people might show up anytime. Um, so making sure that you're, you're thinking through the different and like, what if somebody is unhappy or some, you know, just all the different things that can happen. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of great resources out there. I mean, 
a lot of places have put together stuff for agritourism. So we're able to pull some of that information um, and then kind of adapt it for things to think about with oyster farms. And another thing, the project before this, um, when they created the North Carolina Oyster Trail, they, they did some research on what people were willing to pay for those oyster experiences on farms. And they it was more than the top that they looked at. So there, there's untapped potential there. So I think a lot of the, the producers saw like, oh, people are really interested in having this experience and connecting with this, um, this product. So there's th that, that probably helps with the interest. <laughs> Doesn't have to be long, but I'm just thinking five minutes. But there were some, there were some people that didn't get to pose their questions, some speakers, and we have some free time now to be able to do that. First, uh, we have enough seats here. Yeah, just yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay, great. Since Scott just spoke, I just want to ask if there anybody who's very big here has any specific questions for for him based on his presentation. Uh, if not, I have a question for you, Eric, and that is that when you were talking about valuations and uh, comparing the uh, commercial industry to the recreation industry, you said we could compare apples and oranges there again. And I just want to know from a technical standpoint or a research standpoint why we can't do that. Yeah, so there's not there's not a reason you can't come up with comparable numbers. I think the it's often the case that there's a number of different ways of representing okay. the the values. So, um, so the the two classics you see are just some some economic impact number, right, in dollars, and then a number of jobs created. So, just thinking about those two, right, those are not they're not additional to each other, right? The economic impact is what's creating the jobs, uh, and so. Uh, so oftentimes they're represented as like these are the impact these are the two impacts but all the jobs all the income from those jobs all the ways that the income is spent from those jobs are all included in the economic impact number. then there's often uh two types and so i think one of the challenges is there's a a software pro program that you use where you you enter in some some things and it spits out an economic impact number um and what that what number can come out can be what I showed, which was the contribution to GDP, which is kind of the best the best measure an economic economist would have for um, what an economic impact is, which is how much does an activity in a location contribute to that area's uh, measure of their economic activity that we measure, which is like GDP. Um, but oftentimes there's there's these other numbers that are like total impact which adds up kind of all the sales at all the levels and ends up double counting uh, a lot of the sales so like i was saying like the the, the commercial harvester sells their fish for three dollars a pound right and then the the distributor sells it for 350 a pound if you add up the three dollars and the 350 you get 650 that's the total economic impact but that's not right the fish sold for 350 so it's it's only contributed 350 to the economy now there's there's different multipliers and stuff in there but i think that's that's the main challenge and that and then the second i think that the bigger issue is that often these are not used to be informative they're used for advocacy mm -hmm. right so you get you create an economic impact assessment to try to sell a bill of goods uh often to a legislature or you know, a local municipality trying to get get something funded, and because of that, you know, you you not only try to show that bigger number, which may not represent the economic reality, but you also try to get as big of a number as you can out of it. And so, what you have to what you think about when you when you look at those numbers is you go back and say, what was the methods they used to get the number right? Because if you're thinking about I go back to the stadium all the time. It, what really matters is the assumptions that you make. And if you actually read through a lot of consultant reports on economic impact studies, 
uh, you can't find the assumptions that they made in there to get to the numbers uh, or they're they're very broadly made. Um, and so that's that's again where you have to be wary. So if you see an, you know, if you see a number that's contribution to GDP and it's done by someone who in their report gives all the assumptions that they made, those numbers are generally comparable. But if you can't find the the assumptions that they made or you know it's some some other measure other than contribution to GDP, that, that can't be compared to the contribution to GDP. Thank you. Sir, I was just wanted to ask you the work you're doing to um, reduce shark mortality. Would that technology have any application for other bycatch issues? It wouldn't have any application for other bycatch species because you're harnessing the uniqueness of the sensory biology of sharks. Okay. <clears throat> but as everybody saw, it can be clipped on to an individual angler's line too or to like a charter boat's outrigger too. So there's nothing to suppose that it couldn't work in other fishery sectors. Scott, the question that I have for you is, is when you're talking about stewardship opportunities for recreational anglers, do any of those stewardship opportunities or see concern for the continuity of resources, does that in any way overlap with what we see on the commercial fishing side? Do they have an appreciation for what commercial fishing yeah, well, I mean, there's I, I didn't show it, but there's been a there's been a growing trend um, in catch and release fisheries where um, fish are played with and then released for the opportunity to, to catch again. And so the challenge is a lot of times is that the the intentions of the two different sectors are at odds. They both want healthy resources, but they want resources at different times in their life histories, like commercial fisheries want generally a lot of smaller fish, harvestable size. In, in general, saltwater anglers, fishermen and sport fishermen in general, want the opportunity to catch less but larger fish. And for, lar for fish to get large, they have to start small and make, make it through the gauntlet to become large. And so it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. And that's why North Carolina is so controversial because we have, the state has to manage both recreational and commercial interests of, of a shared resource. And Anne, with regard to the oyster trail, it has gotten quite a bit of publicity. I saw the state article. And I was just wondering, are is it driving more business uh, to the uh, to the producers? Are they seeing, you know, not only the increase of awareness of who they are and what they do, but also the increase in revenues from the for tours and in bond products? Yeah, I don't know if I can speak for for the producers themselves. It definitely is. There's been a lot of attention and a lot of major media outlets. There was a Condé Nast article last fall, I think, that highlighted the Oyster Trail. Um, that, that's one of the things we have been tracking for the trail members is the amount of uh, basically free media they're getting by being a part of the trail so that we can offer that when we are trying to get people to become part of a trail. So that that's kind of how we spin the economics there of like what their value in the trail is instead of trying to get that direct input. But we do ask people in that survey how they heard about this place or if they've heard about the Oyster Trail so we can try to capture at least some of that. Um, so we're trying to pick up on that, but I can't directly say how much or if people are having that drive from, from the, the media. But and we, we work closely with Visit North Carolina and, and several of the tourism development authorities around the state to try to just make sure they know about the trail. Um, and if they're pitching stories to media, they can make sure to include something because it's something new and different that, that that is really pretty popular and people are enjoying reading about. It's always fun to open a new magazine and see an article about the Oyster Trail. I sent that picture to Jane when I opened my mine. I got mine in the mail. I was like, Jane, the Oyster Trail's in the our state magazine. Um, so yeah, it's exciting to see how much people are interested in it. Mm -hmm. Angel, the question I have for you is this: is that um, obviously on the commercial fishing side, I do hear a lot about people thinking that commercial fishermen aren't great stewards of the environment, and I have learned by working with culture industry that you know farmers aren't always considered good stewards of the environment. I'm just wondering that with the interns you've worked with on the fisheries and on the farm side, if incoming students had those perceptions at the beginning of their internship and if that changed 
at the end of yeah, the internship. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, I think personally, like part of my own, you know, fulfillment and enjoyment and working with these students is just like hearing their change in perceptions, you know, and I think so many of them never are like, we have so many expect. One of the students talked about like, we have so many expectations on fisheries, you know, they have to know how to like take care of their boat. They have to know how to fish. They have to know how to take care of the resources. And now we're asking them to be like great at technology and media. And I think just like here, definitely had some like perception changes and that, um, maybe thinking about farmers and fisheries as, um, I'm trying to think about how to politically correct say, but just maybe not the most like progressive or caring uh, people and really like getting to know them as people and building a relationship with them and hearing their the side their business and like the family side of it and I think has really like changed. And can I ask a question? Sure. Um, Scott, I, I'm curious. You know, like, are there is there much social media presence in the educational world? Like, I'm thinking about the blog posts could easily be turned into little like reels on mm -hmm. uh, you know social media reels. Like that could be a really cool project for an intern, but also just like personally, like I'd like to learn more, but I don't have time for a 12 hour class. But right. like I would totally watch, like love to learn a little bit more about the education side. Yeah, of I think there's a lot of opportunities. And like I said, like I mentioned, the 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 great thing about having a project that is not short lived is it you have a lot of content that's now curated. And so there's a lot of it opens up a lot of opportunities to do different things that you hadn't really planned on, like curricula, um, you know, repackaging it into, you know, social media types of things. And yeah. we have some new folks on staff that we're going to help with that. So, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I would personally be interested, but I also think that lots of people like thinking about that impact. Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't be super complicated if the information is already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I mean, visualizing the graph that you had, Eric, in your presentation that had the um, different meat protein factors. Um, so the you know, fish seafood was very small, and chicken and beef and, and pork were larger. Um, and then and the question is kind of for anybody who wants to, to jump in. It sounds like there's a lot of diversification of promotion of producers and, and seafood as a resource, but not all of it involves increasing the people who are the number of people eating seafood. Um, and when I saw that graph, a part of me wants to eat it up. Right. I'm like, oh, we need to like, reduce the chicken and cut back on the beef before we increase our seafood consumption. Can the seafood um, in the fishery withstand more consumer I mean, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, wild wild caught production plateaued years ago. I mean, the, the growth that we see in the seafood industry is with aquaculture. That that is what has been that's what's dry, that's what's trying to meet the current demand. The other thing is like domestic versus international production. You know, I'm sure everybody knows, you know, 80, 90 percent of of seafood that we consume is imported, you know, from other countries. Um, and, you know, just to put things in perspective from a local seafood issue, when you think about North Carolina in terms of commercial wild caught production, we're kind of in the middle in terms of production values, right? We're not, we don't have the major fisheries like um, scallop fishery and the um, um, uh, lobster fishery. You know, we have an amalgam of many small fisheries that collectively are not valued very much. And when you think, when you put North Carolina in the context of the country, 60% roughly of, of pounds landed in value comes from Alaska. So if you're not looking for salmon or crab or halibut, you're left with everything else, which is very small volumes, which have to be distributed. So in terms of wild caught production, it's, it's a niche product and it should be a niche product because of the of where it stands in the marketplace. And are there some incentives to the, the 
another uh, graph that you can know is correct that uh, mentioned how many volumes going out of the state, and there are some incentives to kind of keep it in the state. And that's where, I mean, a lot of our North Carolina seafood is sent out. I think that's where, like, if some growth is, but Barry knows a lot more about that. That's I'm sure. Right now, we have a lot of product going on north because there are several ships, consortiums up north that will accept ice product, and those are the groups that actually do um, whatever processing, packaging, and distribution that processes down here in Canada doesn't want to do. Um, what we are seeing is that more of our processors who are in the wholesale trade are getting into retail. And a lot of that product stays right here in North Carolina because uh, with retail, they can set a price that they want and get higher margins on that product too. And so a lot of the direct marketing work we're doing with them is to encourage more consumption at the more state. Well, we're at time, but I want to thank our, our speakers here. Thank you all for attending this session. So if you all give me a round of applause.